Good evening. Good evening. My colleague does that and I love it. So I've started doing it. I'm Cleve Corner. I'm the manager of author and speaker engagement at the Pratt. Thanks for coming out this evening. I really appreciate it. Um, Adrian and Jason are going to have about a 45 minute conversation and then we're going to take your questions for about 15 minutes. Questions can come from that microphone and there'll be a microphone here. I asked you to get up because we're also streaming this to folks back home so that way they can hear your question. Uh, Adrian is also has a PowerPoint, of course he does. This is a graphic memoir. You'll be able to see everything off of that screen to my left. I want to thank Urban Reads Bookstore for being here selling books. If you don't have a copy of the book yet, please purchase one. Have it signed after the event. Two quick uh, notes, uh, we have probably like two events a week now that we uh, bring into this space. And I'm very excited that on March 16th, uh, strength coach Chrissy Young is gonna be here. Her book is called The Body Liberation Project. And it's how uh, we understand racism and diet culture and helps collect, uh, cultivate joy and build collective freedom, something to think about. And then Teresa Runstetler, she's a local author. She has a book out called Black Ball. And it's, uh, it's about the NBA during the 1970s and how players like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Spencer Haywood didn't just change the way the game was played, but also changed the way the players received agency and also free agency. So something if you're here for this event uh, and you're looking at the sports angle of it, I'd, uh, I'd ask you to think about coming out to one of those programs. All of our other programs are available online at Pratt.org. Check them out. Tonight, I'm happy to welcome Adrian Mat Tika to the Pratt Library to discuss his book on the life of the first black heavyweight boxing champion, Jack Johnson. The son of formerly enslaved parents, Johnson worked his way to the top of the boxing world despite facing widespread racism and segregation. This was personified by a July 4, 1910 bout deemed the battle of the century against former white heavyweight champion, Jim Jeffries. Tonight, Adrian will be joined in conversation by award-winning author, Jason Reynolds. Adrian Matika is the author of oh, the award-winning poetry collection, The Big Smoke, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and National Book Award. He is an English professor at Indiana University Bloomington and a former poet laureate of the state of Indiana. Jason Reynolds is the author of several award-winning books, including Look Both Ways, Long Way Down, and Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism in You with Ibram X. Kendi. He was a 2020-2022 National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. In the Library Journal Starred Review, they wrote that this book's lyrical narration and powerfully evocative black and white illustration combined for an uncommonly propulsive, completely immersive biography. An author, Wilfred Santiago, called Last on His Feet a powerful work, no gimmicks, straightforward narrative with a timeless appeal, beautifully lyrical. Jack Johnson knew his place in the world and liked the like the finer things in life. He carved inroads to success with fits of righteous anger and keen business sense in a time when the odds were overwhelmingly stacked against someone like him. But if you think Jack Johnson would bend the knee, then you don't know Jack. It's my great pleasure to welcome Adrian Matika and Jason Reynolds to the Pratt Library. <laughs> Thank 
I got water. Good evening. Oh. <laughs> it's always such a weird thing because before, at the, no one can hear anything that the, uh, any host says when you're backstage. And so you're just hearing like, whoa, 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 right? And in the meantime, my friend and I were just like talking trash. You're just back there like doing your thing. And then it's like, oh, wait, shh, they're calling your name, right? <laughs> and, and then we run out on stage. Um, I, uh, I'm Jason. And this is the great Adrian Matika, nah. who we're here to celebrate tonight. <laughs> I want to say really quickly, just uh, my own my own housekeeping. <clears throat> uh, there's a bookstore, there's a bookseller that's selling Adrian's books. And so uh, everybody, if you don't have one, you should probably buy one of Adrian's books. Because even though we come to celebrate the, 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 in, the, the publishing of said book, the truth is, is that these books are hard to continue to publish mm -hmm. if you don't buy them. So like we like to... People hate to say these things, but like sometimes you just got to get to it, right? The brass tax, which is this is a business, and in order for art to continue to be made and, and, and to exist in the world, we do unfortunately have to put our money behind it. Uh, so buy yourself one or ten, you know what I'm saying? If you got people you want to pass the book around, are y'all all right? This is a stiff crowd, boy. This is we're, we're going to be this. We're friends in real life, so this is also going to be a very casual conversation. So it's so feel free to loosen up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was just. Also, um, we need to support the booksellers too. And we, and we need to support the booksellers and they can't be supported if we don't put our money in it. Yes, yes. All right, so let's get this thing going. We got 45 minutes to chat. Uh, I'm gonna do my very best to not take this into all the personal territories <laughs> I really wanna go into. Um, but let's start just to, I guess, to give people just a bit of a, bit of a, a taste of the tone and, and like what, what we're doing here and what this story and your work in general is about. I know you're gonna do a bit of a reading. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for being here. J Jason's one of my favorite writers and friends, so this is just a joy to be here at Pratt to do this work. Um, I wanted to start, if it's okay with you all, with a poem. Um, I, I wrote a book called The Big Smoke that started this project in 2005 is when I started the whole thing. So I thought I would I wanted to invoke Jack Johnson in that way. Also, it marches his birthday month, so. Um, I should have done the math to figure out how old he would have been today. I think 141 or something like that. So this is a, a poem called Battle Royale that starts the whole adventure. It's the only thing from um, this book of poetry that also exists in the graphic novel. Um, it's, the graphic's a totally different project, or object, I should say. Y'all know Battle Royales? I'm talking about uh, if you're a WWE fan or if you read Ralph Ellison, one of those two things. <laughs> That's what's or, up. Or both, like, like me. <laughs> yeah, you can do both things, right? Battle Royale. And this is in the voice of Jack Johnson. Back then, they'd chain a bear in the middle of the bear garden and let the dogs loose. Iron chains around a bear's neck don't slow him too much. A bear will always make short work of a dog. Shakespeare said Sackerson did it more than 20 times to dogs and wildcats alike. And since most creatures are naturally afraid of bears, there wouldn't be much of a show in the bear garden. So the handler sometimes put the bear's eyes out or took his teeth to make the fight more sporting. I believe you need eyes more than you need teeth in a fight, but losing either makes a bear a little less mean. Once baiting was against the law, some smart somebody figured colors would fight just as hard if hungry enough. So they rounded up the skinniest of us, had us stripped to trousers, then blindfolded us before the fight. They turned us in hard circles a few times on the ring steps like a motor car engine before pushing us between the ropes. When the bell rang, it seemed like I got hit from eight directions. I didn't know where those punches came from, but I swung so hard, my shoulder hadn't been right since because the man said, only the last darkie on his feet gets a meal. So that's how Jack Johnson started fighting. Oh, <laughs> so you, like you can tell the difference between a, like a regular crowd and a poetry crowd because poetry crowds just sit. <laughs> yeah, because the assumption is like we'll clap at the end of all your poems. You know? Yeah, we'll just we'll just collaborate at the end. It's like my least favorite part of the poetry community <laughs> is that you are. Have you ever been to a poetry reading? It's wild because you just read. Let's say he's going to read like 10 poems. He just reads all 10 and you're just sitting there. And sometimes poets don't, you don't really know when the end of the poem is. And so you're just kind of <laughs> waiting and then he's on to the next one, right? Yeah. He's like, poem for my dead, my dead father. And you're like, oh, we're moving on to the next one, right? I mean, it's such an interesting thing. Yeah. Look, I, I want to talk a bit about, about muses. Mm -hmm. So I know, I, 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 Big Smoke is one of my, that's another book, by the way. The Big Smoke 
is the poem, the collection that he read from. Feel free to buy that one. Ten of them, wonderful collection. Mm -hmm. We got a National Book Award now for that. Yeah, National yeah. Book Award nominee, a finalist for that. So basically, you should go and get it. It's a masterwork, and I, I'm I'm not gassing this. It really is a masterwork. But I was, I, and I know you. This was years in the making as well. So mm -hmm. my question is, why Jack Johnson? There is a thing. There's obviously a theme. Uh, what is it about this particular American figure, mm -hmm. this black man, um, this this person, this hero to many, mm -hmm. uh, a villain to others? Uh, what is it about him that that keeps you sort of keeps the wheels turning? Oh man, there's so much there. I think he's the the quintessential kind of American. Uh, icon, right? When they talk about people pulling themselves up from their by their bootstraps or whatever kind of nonsense that we were all given with during the Reagan era, I just I think about it um, as the great example. So we have someone whose parents were enslaved, and he became the most famous, or like you said, infamous person on the planet, thanks to his his skill, his 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 wits, you know, his tenacity and his his. Um, lack of belief in the system that said he was supposed to be one thing when he wanted to be something else. Like I, that, that just resonated with me when, you know, from the moment I learned about it, I was like, yeah, you know, people have been telling me one kind of thing my whole life too. And here I am, you know, all public school kid, section eight, all of it. And here we are sitting at the library talking about a book. It wasn't because people were encouraging me necessarily. It was that, that I just wasn't listening to them try to keep me from doing it. And that seems to me to be a, a Something one of the, one of the few things that Jack Johnson and I um, share, right? Because a lot of the other stuff, I, I mean, he's a great athlete, got gold teeth. Like I, I don't I share anything. Say, are you like are you one of these boxers, right? No, no. My, you know, my dad wanted me to be a boxer. And knowing yeah. what I know about your father, this does not surprise me. <laughs> yeah, my, yeah, my dad wanted me to be a boxer, and I went in there and I got punched in the nose once, and I was like, yeah, I'm good. Oh, my <laughs> older brother, my older brother was was a was a boxer. It, it, I wrote this book years ago called When I Was the Greatest about yeah, this yeah. kid. He's in the boxing ring, mm -hmm. but he never has any fights. And that's literally, my older brother was like, yeah, I gotta go to boxing practice. But he was like, I don't want to fight any matches. I just <laughs> I just want to go and like pretend that I'm learning to box. But the moment yeah. that, oh, you got a batch on Saturday, he was like, I'm probably gonna have to quit quit boxing. <laughs> I'm like, this is, this is <laughs> you know, I, I, I look at Jack Johnson as sort of like the blueprint for Black Moxie. Mm -hmm. Like really the beginning of like there is no Muhammad Ali. Like all of that, all of that gusto that Muhammad mm -hmm. Ali is sort of is famous for now was hated for then. Right. Right. Jack Johnson did that at a time where it was even more dangerous. Right? Like the kind of confidence that one must have, mm -hmm. the kind of the brashness of his life, which was yeah. already a brash life just because he was alive. <laughs> Right, and yeah. then to be like, yeah, I'm better than you. Yeah, I'm better yeah. than all of y'all. You can call me your names. I'm, I'm, I'm rich. I'm right. All of this <laughs> stuff, right? That's like, right. I know we don't talk about, you know, we don't talk about Mr. West anymore as much as we did. But mm -hmm. like, even what he was in his younger years, right? It's like this is this is where that comes from. Right. You right. know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. That 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 kind of that the why well, I, I started out when I was reached, the first thing I, that that came to mind was that he's a 21st century athlete. In the, in, the, in, the, in the turn of the 20th century, right? As soon as I, you know, see, just, you know, physique and the way that he approached the game, the way that he, you know, he was so swift to talk trash. They used to call that mouth fighting back then. Like if you talked, you know, you try to get your opponent angry by talking things and there, there were rules to it. Not a lot, just you didn't ever get, you weren't supposed to talk about anybody's mom. And you weren't supposed to talk about their significant other or their kids. But anything else was you could talk about same it. Same rules. Yeah. Same rules apply today, right? You can say whatever you want, but it's over my mother. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. When you talk about my mom, then it's it's, it's, well, it's, it's, good. it's escalated. As now. we say, fight words. Yeah. Right? Like you say something yeah. about my mother, then. You know, so, but even as we're talking about this, I, it makes me think that um, what I was what I was reading as him being a 21st century athlete was actually him being, like you said, the blueprint for what 21st uh, 21st century athletes became. Yeah. Talking about himself in third person. You know, like making sure that when he showed out, he showed all of it, right? He would change clothes four or five times a day to yeah. make sure everybody could see how extensive his wardrobe was. It's like the famous picture of Magic Johnson with the fur coat, <laughs> right? Like there's that famous picture yeah. right, of him walking through the tunnel with yeah. the fur coat. And it's like, yeah, like he's from Lansing, Michigan. Right. But look at him now. Right? Like yeah. that's a huge thing. You yeah. know, like I just, I think so much of his life, for me at least, I'm just curious about what what makes a man at that time 
not be afraid of the news, right? Because that's a yeah. real concern, right? During this particular time, what yeah. makes a man who is an obvious threat? Mm-hmm. What makes a man that bold to be like, hey, I'll come get me, mm-hmm. come hunt me, right? Do it, do your worst. Uh, and, and I think about that all the time. Yeah. Did you learn anything? Like, what what do you think? What was most surprising over the course of years of researching this person? You know, I think what was, you know, there were things about his biography that were, you know, surprising, just little bits and pieces. Like he was in, he was in Mexico during the Mexican Revolution and he was fighting, he was making money by fighting with uh, Amelia, uh, for Amelia Zapata's uh, troops. And then he would go and then do the same thing and spar exhibitions for Pancho Villa's troops. It was going back and forth, do like just you know making boatloads of money until they figured it out and they ran him out of out of, out of Mexico. So there were all these little things like that, you know, I mean, sort of um, episodic things. He was a he he was a spy in World uh, in World War One for the U.S. government, who was also trying to bring him back to put him in jail. And you know, they, and he got fired as a spy, though it didn't end up in the book because we couldn't make it interesting. But he was a spy for a month, <laughs> and he's, in this month, he was hanging around uh, uh, Barcelona and hanging around the, the, the docks, trying to figure out where some secret base for the Germans were. Like, and but he was supposed to be looking, but was in fact just taking money and going out and partying with his wife. <laughs> And <laughs> imagine, imagine having a life so interesting that your time as a spy isn't interesting enough to get to go in your, it in your book. It didn't even it didn't even make it in. Yeah, yeah. Well, this book this book was four, like it was about four hundred pages on the first version of it, and we knew it was supposed to be three, so we had to cut back so much. And all you know, and a lot of those kind of mo- those little bits and pieces, like we're talking about, that were just so fascinating, um, had to had to get dropped for narrative stuff. I want to talk a bit about form mm-hmm. and and format. Right, like for this book, this is one of the most beautiful graphic novels I've ever I've ever had the pleasure of of, of holding and reading. Um, Thank you. For those of you who haven't opened your books yet, this is like this is this is a feat, right? This is something pretty special, uh, and it also feels ageless. You know, it feels you know obviously maybe not your your five and six year old, but this is a book for every. It's one of those books that like can be read. You know how like when Mouse came out or when there's a couple of those books where you're like, man, March was one of those books mm-hmm. or Drowned City. For those of you who know that book, masterpiece, right? Like mm-hmm. this is another one of those where it's like, man, this is something that my 12 year old, 13 year old can sit with. My 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 80 year old dad might would love to read this and mm-hmm. my, you know, mm-hmm. and everybody in between, right? It's one of those those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. I know you personally and I know mm-hmm. you're a comic comic head. I yeah. know that's your, 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 <laughs> definitely you've taken me to the comic book store yeah. more than enough times. And, and I and I also know you obviously you're you're a poet. This mm-hmm. obviously seems to be the perfect marriage. I just want to mm-hmm. talk a bit about um why you chose this particular format, this particular casing for the story, for the second version, the second iteration of you telling the story. Yeah. Thank you for that. And, and Mouse was a big part of trying to figure out how to navigate really difficult material. Um, Kyle Baker's book, Confessions of Matt Turner, which um, he originally self-published and then published as a volume, was another book that really um, gave, gave me a template for how to deal with the kind of things that we don't like to look at all of the time, sure. you know, but need to make sure that they're not erased in a particular way. A lot of slurs in this book. Yeah, there's a lot of slurs. A lot of slurs. There's, and, there's, and so I should say, I'll come right back to this, but um, we only made, the illustrator and I only made one change to the book in terms of facts. And I'm, I put a note in the front of it to make clear that it, we changed the, the year when Jack Johnson met his wife so she could be part of the book more, more um, robustly. Because if we you know, followed the actual chronology, she wouldn't have been in it as much as I wanted her to be. So we changed when they met just by one year so that she could be in it more. Um, that's super important. Actually. You know, yeah, I mean, it's it's so important. I mean, she's incredible, um, and she's a white woman. So, yeah. so like to think about this big man that everyone hates, and then after he finishes finishes fighting, he goes and kisses his white wife, right? Who's, you know, which who's, is wild <laughs> to consider at this particular time. Yeah, in nineteen like in nineteen ten, and she's in the audience cheering for him, cheering for his fights, and it's just and that's but that's some of the places where that language appears where it's directed at her. Yeah. Um, and she's, you know, I, I wasn't able to spend as much time with her as I would have liked. We, there were multiple scenes that we ended up having to cut, but um, the thing about her, she deserves her own book. And that was, 
that was at the, sort of at the front. So when, when we were trying to figure out how to do the next part of this project, I always knew it was going to be two books. When I finished the Big Smoke, I knew there was another book, but I didn't want to write another book of poems. Because for me, writing a poem is, is a discovery and learning. And I'd already learned what Jack Johnson's voice sounded like in my head. I'd already learned the, the cadence of his, of his life poetically for me. And so to go back and try to do that again, it would be like, you know, making part two of something and part two doesn't hold up to part one, right? So I knew it needed to be something different. And um, it's gonna sound like a flex, but you know it's not. I, was, uh, I came up with the idea for this at the National Book Awards and I'd already lost, but I won because I was there. I was sitting at the bar with my editor. Who won your year? Um, no, um, Mary Shebist. She won. Um, but Gene Yang's book, Boxers and Saints, which is a really beautiful graphic novel, was a finalist too. Oh, masterpiece. And it's so good. And, it, and they have, if, if you've ever live streamed these or been there, they, they show all of the author's faces and the books on big screens everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it just rotates all over time. Jason's been there like 15 times. He knows what I'm talking about. Like they, <laughs> like they just, they rotate, they rotate this. And I was sitting there. And, and lost like, all, every time, <laughs> just so we clear. And I was like, you know what? I don't know what we're going to do with this next book. I was, and, and I looked up and there was Gene's book. I was like, it should be a graphic novel. Does he uh, know this? Um, no. He knows no, that. Gene, no. if you're watching this, I'll <laughs> yeah. make sure you find out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was like, it should be a graphic novel. I was so inspired by that book. I thought, you know, but being, you know, having spent so much time in Jack Johnson's world, I picked up a little bit of that ego, like a little bit of the hubris. And I was like, oh, this will probably take me about a year to knock out. That was 2013, and it's out now. So almost 10 years between the idea and, and it coming together now. It solved a... Um, one of the complications of writing a book of poetry is that there's you know, obviously no visuals. It's all reliant on what you can imagine and what can be described. And so one of the things that I really wanted from whatever came next was to show Jack Johnson. Like I wanted to, instead of me saying, yeah, he's 6'2 and 250, if you can imagine that, and he's fighting people who are like 5'8 and 175, if you can picture these, instead of having to do that, I just wanted people to be able to see it and see the, the, you know, the, the majesty of this guy and how, um, how dangerous he must have felt to the people he was, he was not only fighting against, but fighting in front of. Mm. Like part of that, that blood sport is also about fear and hoping that somebody's gonna put him where they imagine he should be. And none of them did. It took the, took the government to do it. Like the entire government going after him for three years. Before they got him for his wife, right? They got him for, well, they, they got him for one of his girlfriends. So, 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 so Jack Johnson got, um, convicted of the Mann Act, which is um, taking someone across state lines for immoral purposes. And one of his girlfriends, like he had his, his white wife, but he also had two white girlfriends that he would travel with and just kind of send them ahead to wherever he'd be. And then they'd just kind of be stashed in hotels so he could go visit them, right? And when his wife would find out and he'd make them leave because according to him, he didn't know, have anything to do with it. They were just following him. It's like, I don't know. I don't know why they're here. But he would, you know, he would pay for their stuff. I've never seen this in my life. <laughs> How did you get here? Right. Like, um, so, so one of them, her name was Mel. Um, at some point, his wife was just like, if you don't get rid of her entirely, I'm leaving. And so he did. He gave her 500 bucks and a train ticket. He's like, I never want to see you again. And that didn't sit well with her. And so when the government was sniffing around, trying to find something on him, she showed up and was like, hey, you know, you want dirt on him? Let me tell you. And it turned out that he'd, um, he, would, he would make her pay for the hotels and trips and keep receipts. And then he would reimburse her like it was a business expense. And so she's like, you know, you want this guy? Let me tell you. And she had actual receipts to give to the government. And that's how he ended up getting convicted. Because he was just so efficient. <laughs> he was. <laughs> even in his wrongdoings. Even in his wrongdoings, he was... I mean, he's like, you know, he's meticulous in his record keeping. Yeah, you know, it's wild. Know? It's, a, it's a wild thing to consider. At that time, we joke about it, but the truth is, yeah. at that time, all of this is 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 story worthy, right? It's yeah. noteworthy. It's a fascinating story. Yeah. I, I also want to talk a bit. I, we should show. Can you show? Yeah, because yeah, we're, yeah, we're we talking should. about sort of what it looks like, and you wanting to show, you wanting to show who he was and what was happening at that time. Yeah. I think that that you know Yusuf Daudi, who did the who did the art for this book. Yeah who I'd never heard of until this book and who I'm now like, boy, I hope this guy has a beautiful career ahead of him. Um, it, it's, it's really something special. Yeah. Can, can they see, can y'all see the artwork? 
Yeah. Oh, there's screen. Oh, okay. Yeah, set up there. Yeah, see, I'm glad you brought up Yusuf. So Yusuf is has a he has another English language graphic novel called Monk about the loneliness. Oh, he did monk. the Monk joint, mm -hmm. which is um, amazing. And then he's got twelve others that are in French. He lives outside of Paris, which was a great excuse to to you know. At some point, he wanted to come to Indianapolis to work with me. He's like, I'll just come to Indianapolis. I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> No way. I mean, you know, no. I, I think we, we work much better on the French countryside. I, yeah. I don't know, like, my idea is really, really flow <laughs> yeah, out there. Yeah, right. yeah, but Yusuf and I had the, the idea, and we're, I'm going to show this to you now, that we wanted to make, we wanted to make a portrait of his life. We didn't want to make, you know, a, like a, a memoir or, or, or a autobiography or something. We wanted to make a portrait, and we wanted to make an art book, and I think he um, his work is so beautiful. He, he held up his end, and I just hope that I did too. So I'm going to share this with you. Um, he smoked you, just so you can. Oh my God. Just, smoked you. I, you know, I you got to work harder. You know, yeah, I could have put no words in it, and it would have still made sense, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not the artist really. This is just, it's just a whole other thing. So, so what I'm going to, I want to share with you is the beginning of the book, and I'm only going to read um, the voiceover. On top, it's Jack Johnson's voice. There's going to be dialogue. There's a lot of language in it. I'm not going to read all of that, but you'll see it. And hopefully, it's um, it, it's zoomed in enough for you to be able to read the the. But even if not, you'll you'll get the idea. Men have been locked in combat since before there was money in it. They fought with their hands. They fought with rocks and sticks. They fought over pretty women. They fought over meat and who got to sit next to the fire on winter nights. Fighting is just a more entertaining version of those prehistoric battle battles, and I'm the best battler there ever was. July 4th, 1910. Dawn came like a comeuppance. The old men in Reno said they'd never felt the sun so close. It was the kind of hot that makes water disappear from your glass like magic and boils sweat on the forehead. Egg fried without a fire. One man's cigar lit on its own. That didn't stop the 20,000 spectators who came in automobiles on horseback and by horse-drawn wagon. Trains ran from all parts of the country every 30 minutes. When there wasn't any more room to squeeze inside, fans rode on the tops of the trains. Better to tie yourself to a locomotive than miss the battle of the century. One of the things you'll see in this is like, um, this Reno Evening Gazette is an actual piece of the newspaper. There's a ton of archival material in the book like that. Of course, Tex Rickard picked Nevada as the home for our contest. Of course, he picked Reno. Reno, where divorces were as easy to get as a shot of whiskey and just as cheap. Gamblers, sports, prostitutes, and fight fans filled the streets and came with all the cash they could carry. Almost all the bets were on Jeffries. Pickpockets and petty thieves were open for business. All those saps betting against me. What's that saying about a fool and his money? The day got hotter every minute as the sun crested the bright desert, but the sport showed up in their gambling suits anyway. The sawmills and carpenters worked through the heat in the day and by torchlight at night to build the stadium in less than three weeks. The whole place smelled like dust, sweat, and new pine used to make bleachers. You could hear the hammers and saws still working as the spectators lined up, but they got it ready. I am ready. I've been ready for this, 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 this since the day I left Galveston to make my fortune. I'm not fool enough to think fate marked me for any kind of special purpose. We make what we are, we, we are from, we make what we are from whatever materials we are given. I quit school in third grade and monarchs and rulers still line up to shake my hand. I've been to every country in the world and they call me champion in all their languages. Listen, a pachyderm is still a pachyderm whether on an African plane or in a zoo in Chicago. It's not fate, it's just who we are. The best prize, I'm, the, I'm a prize fighter, my fists got me here. The best fists a man ever balled up. Thanks to these fists, I've witnessed scenes that poets can't put words to. And thanks to these fists, I'll be the last one on my feet. I think that's a good place to start. It's such a it's such a um a powerful thing to think about. Like mm -hmm. this man, you know, that the whole world 
right? that he was that this was the champion of the world mm -hmm. and yet not seen as even a person right 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 and from galveston texas at that <laughs> at that you know what i mean yeah it's just a what an incredible incredible story now, now just so you all know what's what's for me as a, as a as a writer and for for those of you who are bibliophiles like what's fascinating about the way that it's written is that he he frames the entire the whole book is about a single fight mm -hmm. so it's broken into like rounds and then he, and then so there are these interstitials uh, within the rounds that go back and tell other parts of his life and sort of, you know, so you get there, you get all the meat, but it's all framed around this one fight with this guy, Jim, Jim Jeffries. Yeah. And so talk a bit about choices when it comes to that. Yeah, man. Thank you for, for, for framing it that way too. You know, it was, um, we wanted to write a book that's about a boxer, not about boxing. And it seemed like the best way to do that was to let Jack Johnson be the, the driver for the story. So we came up with this idea, um, at the end of his career, he was working in um, in a thing called Hubert's Museum and House of Odysseys in, in New York City. And you go and you pay a quarter and he would tell you stories. Like, you know, it's like the next person up would be the uh, this guy named CeeLo, the seal fin boy. Um, another, like there was a, a, a bearded woman. It was like one of those spaces. And then Jack Johnson's in there telling stories. So we wanted that to be the frame. And it became clear that everybody always wanted to talk to him about this one fight. Because it was that it paid, they got paid more than anybody had ever gotten paid, hundred and one thousand dollars. Which you know, it, it, the, before that, I think the most it had been thirty-five thousand. So it was just an extraordinary event that the entire world tuned into because Jim Jeffries was um, he retired undefeated. He was like the ideal American in the, the, the minds of white uh, white Americans at the time. And he retired actually because he didn't want to fight Jack Johnson, but they convinced him with all this money to, to come back. And so like, how do we get all of that in, get in the, the brutality of the space that he actually was operating in day to day? I mean, you said this earlier, Jason, um, he could have been murdered any day he walked out of his house and they probably would have thrown a parade for the person who did it. And that's how much they hated him. He's, he's fighting this fight like what, 12, 14 years after Plessy versus Ferguson. I mean, like, this is so all compacted with emancipation. It's all compacted with Jim Crow and all of that, you know, all of that. I mean, his so, parents were slaves. His parents, they you know, were they were enslaved until they were, the, until they were teenagers. And so the idea that, that someone like that, like that robust of a story needed to have an anchor. And we picked this fight because it became such a um, divisive event. In, in American history. We kind of forgotten about it now because the, people got mad about Muhammad Ali, they got mad about, they've gotten angry about other people since then, right? But at the time he was the kind of focal point of everybody's ire. You know, you, you know it's so funny. I, I talk to my, my mom all the time about mm -hmm. all of this stuff because she lived to, you know, 50s and 60s and from the South and has all these stories. And, you know, and when, when, when we went through all of the Kaepernick stuff, mm -hmm. my mom was just sort of like, she was just talking about like what a silly thing like in her mind she's like what a silly thing because she remembers the vitriol for ali right right like how intense it really was like that his life was really being put on the line right you know every day that people refused to even call him by his chosen name for religious purposes people mm -hmm. refused right and mm -hmm. how and she always laughs about like yeah this is we're talking about him and Dr. King, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about two of the most hated human beings. And at, the, at, at Dr. King's death, he was one of the most hated people in America and how he's remembered as, he's revered, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. Ali, right? He dies and we're like, this is one of the greatest things <laughs> in America. It's like, this was a hated man. This was yeah. a man yeah. who was vilified yeah. for yeah. no reason other than the fact that he, that, that he chose to be autonomous, mm -hmm. that he wanted to be a human being uh, unto himself, yeah, right? It's such yeah. an interesting thing. And then you got this guy who was alive 50 years, 60 years, 70 years before these people, mm -hmm. um, the, when it's legal to murder. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's legal to kill. Yeah, they would, and nobody would have blinked. Nope. No, and not at all. Like I said, they probably have thrown a parade for the man. You know, I was, so I was in Louisville last weekend to do a reading, and now the, the Louisville um, airport is named after Muhammad Ali. So that's how that's how much things have changed. I mean, he's got his own. There's a museum down there and all the rest. I mean, he got, he got like Congressional Medal of Honor. He got mm -hmm. 
It's like, bro, he <laughs> <laughs> went to prison. <laughs> yeah, he, exactly. So, 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 you know, this is maybe this is not as useful, but they, when the when we were doing the book, the design for it originally included a um, dust jacket, and there was a quote from Ali on the dust jacket, but they couldn't get the art. So there was something about the dimensions of the art that wouldn't work. So what was they, the quote? It was. Um, he, I had to summarize it because it was kind of long. But what he was saying was that he he said that people think that he's he's like people think I'm crazy, but Jack Johnson was crazy. <laughs> he was like, you know, he's 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 really like you know just in, I'm paraphrasing, but he's like you know he's running around with all these white women. There's nobody there. To, there's like no the Black Panthers weren't there. There's nobody to support him. He's just out there doing it, and he's heavyweight champion. You know, like that is crazy. With fur coats and diamond rings <laughs> yeah. and like it's it's just a if also you should see the documentary it was the unforgivable black oh, yeah, unforgivable black unforgivable black incredible. which is the PBS documentary on Jack Johnson. Basically you should just delve into who Jack Johnson was. Because it's it's him, right? And then there's also the he just intersected with so much. Yeah. Um that was going back to your question about what I'd learned. You know, I came into this thinking, like, do they have tooth? Do they have toothbrushes back then? Did right. you know? Was there, was there were there phones in houses? Like I didn't know anything, so I was learning all about like the movement of technology at this time. So you know, he was around for the Titanic, the Will, uh, the Wright brothers flight, Lindbergh. He, the Lindbergh. He was around for um, Model T Ford being introduced. He was around for the Mexican Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and he was in those places when it was happening. Uh, World War One, um, you know, he was actually around for World War Two too. But like he, you know, he was a vital part of the conversation and all of those other things. People getting indoor plumbing, people getting telephones put into. He was around for all of that. And so in his life, what we imagine is just regular amenities. All of that came to be, and he loved it. He was so he had a he had a patent for a wrench to fix a car, to fix a particular kind of car that doesn't exist anymore. And he also made one of the first car alarms, which you know we all know we're, we're grateful for. Um, but he, the car doesn't exist. It's called a Thomas Flyer. They don't make them anymore. But he still has a patent for the wrench that you need to fix that thing to keep it running. He was so fascinated by like, you know, the, sort of the mechanics of this and the technology of the space um, that you know, it just it seemed really important to try to capture all of it which is not possible one of the world's most fascinating people oh. <laughs> so is, is there i want to make sure i get to questions yeah. is, is there another one so we have a collection of poems we have a graphic novel mm -hmm. are you finna write a movie absolutely not well i wrote a script for the graphic see i knew it <laughs> you should. yeah but now, now this is you know this this has been amazing but i i and when i sent this off when we when yusef and i finished i'm like you know what that's good I can't wait to bring this and share it with people. And once that's done, like it's time for somebody else to to to, to examine this story. This was my version of it. And I tried to get it as close as I could to it. Well, this was our version of it. You said that, um, but I tried to get it as close as I could to to what I found in the archives and all the, the research I did. Um, but it, there are so many different variations of them. I mean, there were so many different variations of Jack Johnson in his own story. You know, there, one of the things that didn't make it in was he would he said talk about how when he was 12 years old, he stowed away on a cotton steamer to go to New York City because he wanted to meet this um, magician who supposedly jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge and, and lived, right? Steve Brody was his name. And he got to Key West from Galveston and they found him stowed away and kicked him off. And so he's in Key West at 12 years old trying to figure out how to get back to Galveston. And he was diving for shells. And he told he's tell the story all the time. He's diving for shells, and he said a 25 foot long shark came and tried to eat him. <laughs> and he said he gave the shark an uppercut, and the shark went swimming <laughs> off. And he was like, "Turns out the sharks are just like other heavyweights; they don't like get upper, you know, like this whole thing." And he would tell the story, and people would see him and be like, "Oh, it's Jack Johnson. Probably happened." You know, he's he's bigger than life for real. So yeah. maybe he did when he was 12 years old fight a shark created his own myth yeah. around himself. Yeah, like he was he was part of that time and American like Jack London pops up in this book for the if yeah. there's anybody in here is a I fan of, <laughs> of Call of the Wild, you know Jack Johnson was an unrepentant or Jack uh, Jack London was an unrepentant racist, hated Jack Johnson. Absolutely despised him. So he pops up and all the stuff that's in the book are direct quotes from him and from his his articles. It's so crazy. <laughs> but you know, but like Call of the Wild, those kind of stories about, you know, man against nature and over You know, this is this is what Jack Johnson was building out around himself. You know, he didn't even have, but he didn't have to make it up. 
you know, the, he was already doing things that um, seemed impossible, you know. Um, he maybe, was a god amongst men. And you, you see him too. He, lo he just looks like, I can't, I know, I'm thinking there's a, there's a, car, there's a I, I don't have it queued up, otherwise I would share, but there's, there's a, the guy who we beat, Tommy Burns, the guy who was the heavyweight champion, who finally agreed to fight Jack Johnson. Like before that, no white fighter like would fight him because it was they called it the color line. They weren't going to do it. But Tommy Burns finally agreed to fight Jack Johnson because Jack Johnson chased him across three or four different continents and just kept like showing up at his fights in the front row. I'll fight you for free. Like, I mean, very Muhammad Ali. Like, what you know, I'll, like, let's do it. <laughs> and Tommy Burns is like, how does this dude have a passport? You know, um, like, please. Oh, this one, oh, this, wow. <laughs> yeah. And the thing about it was he basically bankrupted himself, chasing Tommy Burns around to get this fight. And he's borrowing money from everybody. Like, I promise if I get this fight, I'll be able to pay you back kind of stuff. Um, so he, I think it took him five different stops challenging him before Tommy Burns was like, great whatever, I'll fight you for $30,000. Don't you kind of miss these kinds of celebrities? <laughs> like, real, I mean, like, I know it's different now. We have yeah. also, I mean, it's different. I get it for good reason. We're changing and evolving as a culture, mm -hmm. all of which is important, right? I just don't want to lie to you all. There is a little part of me <laughs> that misses like these kinds of celebrities, like the Miles Davises, yeah. the Muhammad Ali's, the people who are like, like the middle fingers of the world, right? Mm -hmm. These people who are like, I am, I am the I am the person. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. I, like the, yeah. the Bessie Smiths, the, like these these people, the Frank Sinatra's, right? Like mm -hmm. we, there's no more of like the larger than life mystical, mm -hmm. right? These people that are like, I don't know, maybe Michael Jackson is a Lamborghini. Maybe he did turn <laughs> into a cougar in the in that movie, right? Like, you know, I like none of y'all saw Moonwalker. <laughs> Nobody in here knows this reference. Like, I'm with you. I'm with you. you. Know, yeah, 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 right? yeah. You can defy gravity. I yeah. like it's weird, right? But we don't have any of that anymore. And I know that like Jack Johnson's a complicated figure for lots of reasons, mm. but there is something about a person. Like I, I miss I'm 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 sad that kids today don't know magic. Right. That they'll never know the magic of that kind of celebrity, right? Like yeah. they won't know what it is to really believe that Michael Jordan might be able to fly. Mm -hmm. They don't know that because we, because everything is exposed now and we know everybody's personal business. Right. We got social media, right? But I do mm -hmm. miss these kinds of, um, of heroes, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's, it's a wild time. The ones that were untouchable. The ones that were untouchable yeah. and like we were okay with them being untouchable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right, my last question before we open it up. This is a question I ask everybody. Uh, it has nothing to do with your book or any of this, <laughs> but I, I've asked like 70 people this thing and yeah. I should be documenting it because one day maybe I want to write about it all. But <laughs> if you could, if you could, you know, go back to young, young Adrian, mm -hmm. let's say 10 years old, what would you thank him for? Mm. You know, I would thank him for um, spending Saturday afternoons watching boxing with my mom, um, because that's where all of this started. And, you know, and I used to not really like it that much, but she liked it. So I would sit with her and watch it. It's the first time I heard Jack Johnson's name. So it does have to do with the book in a way, you know, um, she, <laughs> my mother would watch these fights. This is in the seventies when boxing was still on TV. It was still one of like one of the sports, you know, it was like one of the premier sports. I didn't even know that was a thing. Mm -hmm. It was like everybody watched boxing back then. Well, not everybody, but most, you know, it was that sport, right? And we would sit and watch him. You know, Ali would be on TV, George Foreman, those just kind of regular TV. Yeah, regular TV. ABC, Why World of Sports. Yeah. Um, and we were sitting there, we'd, we'd be watching this, and my mom would get really into it, just like, you know. And if the person that she was cheering for didn't win, she would say, you know, F that dude, he's no Jack Johnson. That's the first time I ever heard Jack Johnson was. And so my mom would say this. And when I saw the beginning of Unforgivable Blackness, that documentary, all of that came back. So like, wait a minute, this is who my mom was talking about because she never explained who he was. You know, later on, and I hope she's not watching right now, but later on, I found out she was betting on the fights and that's why she was so deep <laughs> into it, you know? But that, that, doesn't, that, part of that, doesn't, that doesn't matter, you know? She's staring up her betting slips. Exactly. Um, but yeah, that's absolutely what I thank him for, for like, you know, having, because I, le I think I learned so much in those afternoons that if I would have just gone to play with my Star Wars toys like I wanted to, I would have missed out on all of them. Yeah, I want to shout out to your mom for yeah. exposing you to such beautiful violence. <laughs> right. And tell him, teaching me how to watch it. 
by it's Ian. A real thing. You know, I don't remember her her language for this, but she was her idea anyway. Was the fight, the boxing, the the art of boxing is not about the punches; it's about what happens between the punches. Yeah, yeah, the sweet science. Mm -hmm. And so, say. hopefully, this book does that and, and thinks about what's happening between rather than the actual the violence. And that itself. it's always been political in this country. Oh, boxing has one. always been a political. I mean. Mm -hmm always and it's something that we all should consider that this is you know we're talking about a, a, a singular war mm -hmm. oftentimes in this country amongst the races at least in those earlier years right mm -hmm. it was always about like the great white hope against like the animal mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. and and that one person is fighting for an entire culture all the irish mm -hmm. all the black folk all the Italians, right? And it's a fascinating thing to choose avatars and to put them in rings and do gladiator sports as a way to fit, which is also the reason, by the way, and then we'll get to, I'm so sorry, <laughs> which is also, by the way, the reason why the Olympics, why the Olympics is such a big deal and was such a big deal because when the Olympics was formed at the beginning of it, it basically was at a time where the entire world was in turmoil. And this was a way to say, hey, 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 instead of us killing each other, let's just compete on the field and whoever mm -hmm. wins this brute this brute competition gets to beat their chests and when this is over we'll go back to murdering each other right mm -hmm. but for, but this was a it was a time out from war right so that we could beat our chests and feel confident and be like yeah yeah it was america that did it yeah yeah it was the greek it was the whoever mm -hmm. it was that it was the germans right and and it's a fascinating thing to think that like the way that we use violence as a way to sort of like extrapolate some sense of self dignity amongst the cultures and races is something that we should probably be exploring in lots of ways like mm -hmm. there's, a, there's something there that we should be excavating yeah i love um, that man all right some questions sorry but there's a lot to talk about <laughs> yeah. Anybody have any questions? There is a microphone. Microphone here and a microphone over there. So if you have a question, please bring it to the mic. I'm going to start very quickly with a question from one of our viewers. It's not my mom, right? Adrian. <laughs> Hi, sorry. <laughs> what is your writing process as you approach approach the structure of your poems? Oh, yeah. That's that's really good. I'm glad that the, the poems are come up because there, there are a lot of poems in this book. And, you know, and when it comes to trying to write a monologue as a poem, um, you know, I, I start all of them with a question. And, the, you know, so how did you start fighting Jack Johnson? And then Jack Johnson answers that question as a poem. And then I get rid of the question and just leave what's there. Um, all persona poetry, no matter who the persona is, should be answering a question. And so um, just on a basic level, that's how I do it. I'm trying to answer the questions I don't know the answers to. How do you write poems, Jason? Because Jason tries to act like he's not a poet, but he's an incredible poet. No, I, I, I don't write very many poems anymore. <laughs> Until you come in my life again, and then you're like, hey, man, we should. <laughs> yeah. Hi, thank Hi. you. Hi. So you did say, like, after you finish your research and um, I believe Jason had mentioned like the significance of like the great white hope and like mm -hmm. what it meant of like pride um, over one race over another. Mm -hmm. But do you believe like it was more so like profit over politics instead? Because it's like when he when Jason said like they stopped everything and I feel like they <laughs> profited more than you know what I mean than like highlighting what was like political yeah yeah so profit was thank you for asking that profit was a big part of it right in fact that was the only reason that Jim Jeffries came back is they just kept up in the amount of money they were offering him and because everybody knew if they could get the two of them in the ring the the inherent racism of the American public at the time was gonna would they would spend whatever they had Right, like they knew that this is a thing. We get these two in the ring. We get the great white right hope in here. We get Jack Johnson, who they were calling the Negro Deliverer. Like we get the two of them in there. There's just going to be money everywhere. Right, there's always profit. And you know, and for Jack Johnson, I mean, he wanted to be seen as the as the greatest boxer of his time, but he also wanted that money. You know, he wasn't fighting because he wanted to be heavyweight champion. He was heavyweight champion because that's how he could get rich. You know, and he was also not a race man, as they used to talk about back then at all. Yeah. He was just, you know what, it's me. I'm out here doing this thing. I'm making my money. And if other people get brought up with that, that's great. 
So yeah, profit is always always at the center, especially with boxing. I'm hyper capitalist, like a super capitalist. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But I also think that, like you know, and we all know that how. But he has no control over over the audience's projection, right? Like so, like whatever he's fighting for is what he's fighting for. But he has no control over all those families who look at him a certain way. You know, mm -hmm. it's like it's like, you know, it's like in a very simple and and. Yeah. You know, in a very, in a very simple and, and dismissive way, it's almost like thinking about like my mom watches Family Feud every night. My mom watches Family Feud because nine times out of ten, it's a black family against a white family. And my mom is always like, "I'm rooting for," her. not not because this family cares anything about my mother, right? They trying to win twenty thousand dollars, but to, to my mom, this small victory is a small victory for everybody, right? Is it? Of course not. But to her, in her mind. Mm -hmm. She's like, hey, we finna get this one. This gonna be ours. Right? <laughs> and this was interesting thing. I don't know. It's a fascinating thing to think about. That we do it with everybody. We do it with, with all of our stars. Mm -hmm. We like, come on, make the right decision. Make do do it for us. And reality is, is that a lot of them cats is like, yo, I love Cat. Cat took ninety million off Nike. Mm -hmm. So, I, how am I? To That's what I'm saying, like. <laughs> but 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 that, but I think two things but two things can be true, no. right? So like, Cap Cap took that ninety million it doesn't make what Cap did any less. But I don't think that was his point to to take a knee to actually profit to take nine you know what I mean, million it, because it was like an act. It wasn't. Effect. I agree with you. Okay. It wasn't. But, but does that does, <laughs> but, but does that does that change the fact that he could have been like, hey Nike, instead of giving me ninety million, why don't you give it to all these organizations fighting this fight? Uh, but, but like, I wouldn't have. have. I'd have been like, give me my ninety million. I'm not gonna lie to you. I don't want to tell no lies. But, but like, you know, it's complicated. It wasn't complicated because like, then it came a racial thing. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Which became political, like Absolutely. a political stance. So once the the political stance came along, when it affected him not being being able to play, that's you know what I mean, and him him being able to like forfeit and not you know what I mean. Absolutely. See, so I can see why the money came in for damages that, you know what I mean? He wasn't bothering anybody. He was just taking the knee. You know? Absolutely. So I believe that's where the money came in afterwards of him taking a silent, you know what I mean, political stance. So that's what I'm saying. Like you would say, like, but. So I was just wanting to know, like. You're speaking of intention going into the thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I think that you're right. I think that there are a lot of people. I think it's complicated, but I do think that there are a lot of people who, who where both of those things are happening, right? I think that like we're, we're complex people, and I think there are people who go into things who are like, "Yo, I'm finna go in here and say all the things that I really mean," right? I'm gonna say all the things that my folks can't say and do all the things that my folks can't do, and I think that those same people, like it, like a, we can pick somebody else who who really is in that space, like a Muhammad Ali, right? It's like, yo, Muhammad Ali wanted to be the greatest boxer ever and a rich superstar. His, he was he, he had all of that in him ego he had all of that in him and also and also representative of the people who we knew had less both of those things happening simultaneously mm -hmm. and i'm gonna take this last one and then you're gonna hold up every, okay. so, 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 <laughs> i got you say your last point, like your last point. <laughs> but why do you think like it's so much politics in boxing when it comes to sports like it's so much politics when it comes to sports and race and like movement you know what i mean mm -hmm. like because of who owns it Okay. We don't own it. None of it. But it ends up to being like not even like political, but more so like race, like Be because of the history of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's I mean, that's the, the center of this book. And, and, and really, thank you for for, for asking that too, because because that, that's the center of it, right? Is that they were able to do all of these things by putting you know playing on that racial aspect of it and politicizing something that was only be like it. Nobody cared about doing that. They wouldn't have done this if it wouldn't make any money, right? Yeah. And, and and there was one of um, Jack Johnson was the the Negro heavyweight champion of the world. They used to call it back then, and. Uh, he, when he became heavyweight champion, he's like, I'm not fighting any black fighters. He did the same thing that white fighters did to him. And his, his attitude was like, I, first of all, he's like, I've already beat all of them. Mm -hmm. But secondly, there's no profit in it. There's no money in me fighting another black fighter, even if, so he's like, I got to get somebody white in here. That's how I, that's how I make my money. In the same yeah. way, Jackie Robinson, the moment they realized they could turn the dollar on Jackie Robinson, then mm -hmm. they let us in, and then suddenly we could play the game. Same in basketball, same in football. We can run down the list, right? If, if there's money there, 
Like when you look at the history of all these sports, we weren't there until there was money to be made. Then we were there. Mm-hmm. Right? Money, money made off us. Off, off of us. Money yeah. made off of us. And then we were there. I mean, the story of Michael Jordan and them sneakers, if you do the history on just the sneakers, <laughs> just the sneakers alone, because they weren't even allowed to wear black sneakers until, until Jordan's shoes. And once they saw Jordan making that money and realized that he took a risk just on that, wearing a black sneaker, then suddenly it was like, hey, look, we got, let's figure this out. Mm-hmm. Right? It's, it, that's just how it goes. We don't own anything. So because we don't own it, we typically, unfortunately, are the people who, who bring forth the money and then they manipulate and exploit it's, us. It's, it's like systematic, you know what I mean, done like that for us not to own anything that continues to profit off of us with, you know what I mean, like sure. the mm-hmm. aspect of it. You so know? you already know. Why you have us do all this? <laughs> you had us talk this all the way through. You already know the answer. Next question. You know the whole answer. <laughs> what you got, brother? What's up, Gingy? What's, what's up? up? What's up? So, uh, I really find it interesting how you were commenting on how it really became a race issue with boxing. Mm -hmm. But I guess I just want to pick your brain on how well do you think that follows up today? Because, okay, not not to be disrespectful, right? Not to Mm -hmm. be disrespectful, right? You talked a lot about Jack Johnson and like, yeah, he's one of the greatest boxers of all time. But he was also one of the greatest of all time in like the early 1900s. Mm-hmm. You say Jack Johnson, and I think, well, how does he stack up against <laughs> Mike Tyson? And here we go. <laughs> over like over the years, you saw more of that, especially in the older days, like Max Schmeling versus Joe, you know. Mm-hmm. But now it's like KSI versus Logan Paul. Mm-hmm. Like those are two completely different figures, right? <laughs> but so, I, I think it's safe to say Jack Johnson would probably handle both of them. <laughs> okay. To be fair, Jack Johnson, Jack Johnson would obliterate KSI. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. yeah, yeah. But, but like, yeah, but I, I think I understand what you're. What do you're you asking. think the same values of it being a white versus a black man to the whole world? Do you think that really? carries much over into like the 2010s and now the 2020s well, well not not at all because boxing isn't important like that anymore to most people like as soon as boxing became irrelevant or, or became less relevant then those those dynamics became less significant right and you know it the average person who might get a, watch a fight at some point or another, they're just watching heavyweights or, you know, I guess when Floyd Mayweather was dancing around, maybe him or something. But, you know, there weren't the, the it's not like it was even in the 70s when this was a, a central piece of people's culture. Like, you know, like the, the, the social fabric included boxing as a thing. You know, and, and Muhammad Ali being one of those people. George Foreman before he was making those grills and everything. I mean, he was one of the hardest punchers in history of boxing. Right. There's not any comparison at all. I think that I think uh, I think Ali would have probably whooped up Jack Johnson, prob- like you know, eighty percent chance. But the thing is, is the the rules were also different back then. So they would grab each other and throw each other around. So it was a different. Even the sport has evolved in a different way. You know, I, and I, th- I know that this isn't what you were what you were asking, but I gotta say it. I think one of the biggest things that that, that, that one of the biggest um, one of the things that wrecked boxing was was one of my favorite boxers, Mike Tyson. And once people saw that there was somebody who could punch so hard that they could knock you out in, in 15 seconds, then that's what that's all anybody wanted. And at the same time, pay-per-view happened and it stopped being available to people without having to spend 75 bucks and stay up until 11 o'clock at night. To see 15 seconds. Yeah, to see 15 seconds. And so it just changed everybody's attitude about boxing. And then on top of that, the UFC happened around that same time too. So now if you really want to watch something violent, you can watch something where it's just basically you do whatever you want in that ring. So there's no more of you like knuckling up, no more gloves, no more of the kind of things that were built in to pretend as if this very, very violent sport wasn't so violent. Name, name me three welterweights, white welterweights, or three white heavyweights fighting the day. <laughs> exactly. So, so, yeah. it, it, so it's even difficult for it to even, even if, you're, even yeah. if it we're going to be a race thing, which it just isn't, it's a different time. It could be. Yeah. They ain't even there. Yeah. Well, and it's also international differently, too. It is internationally different as well. Yeah. Yeah. Which because. Is a tricky thing. Yeah, so that's a really great question, though. So the first part of it, though, is like, oh, boy, here we go. Because I'm always thinking about, well, what would Jordan do right now? And I think, well, he, Jordan's going to be Jordan no matter what, right? Like, you know, so Jack Johnson would be that, but I promise you he would not be a boxer right now. 
yeah, I wasn't trying to compare. Yeah, I just yeah, wanted yeah. to know, like, <laughs> would it be different, like, if we put Jack Johnson in a ring today? How long totally would different. Last? Totally. And he wouldn't want to do it because there's not enough money in it. He would want it. He would be a football player, or he'd play. Supposedly, he was an incredible baseball player. So, you know, he would do something else that would probably bring him the kind of notoriety he wanted. To go back to that earlier question, like he wanted, he wanted, money. he wanted money. That's what he wanted. So, that's, but that's yeah, yeah. You think you could be Jack Johnson? Give me, like, give me like 20 minutes. It's always, the, it's always the kid who's like, he's like yo, do you think he could win the day? My question is, do you think you could be in the day? You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, what, that's very Jack Johnson of you to say. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, thanks for that question, man. I wanted to ask about, I saw the PBS special like 10 years ago. Yeah. I thought he was very compelling, bold mm -hmm. individual. You know, I'm, I'm remembering that from 10 years ago, just watching TV. So, mm -hmm. so what I wanted to ask you was, uh, you know, you're writing a persona poem in the voice of Jack Johnson. That's what your book is. Mm -hmm. Did you struggle with that, with the idea of, you know, I actually think it is a big, bold thing to write a, per a persona poem mm -hmm. from such a figure, larger life person. But did yeah. you struggle and think, well, like, who might be saying what he's saying? Yeah, oh, all, all the time, and even more so with the voices of the poems that are in the the, the poems that are in the voices of white women. You know, I was like, who am oh. I to be <laughs> writing in this voice, right? And not just a white woman, but a white woman in 1910 who's going to be married to a black man. And so, what I did um, to, I was terrified about the entire time. Um, still am, because it is to feel like. It, this at the center of any persona poem about a historical figure should be a level of respect um, that honors the life that was lived. And so I didn't live that life. So I spent eight years working on the first book, researched for two years before I wrote a poem, spent almost 10 years working on this one, researching the whole time, making sure that I, if I was going to do it, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to do it. I was just going to try to figure out a way to resurface things from Jack Johnson. So the poems include a ton of like quotes from him, things like that, where I was trying to make sure that this was, this is his poem, this is his story, this is about him, not about me. And so if you, I don't know if you write poems uh, or, or not, but if you do, the best advice about persona poems, especially historical ones, is the more you can decenter yourself, the better the poem will be. Right, because, like I said, you, you start by asking questions. Yeah. The poem is the answer to. Question. Yeah, yeah, and and, yeah. and you and know, I I'm just sorry. want to say that I support your effort on that. It looks like you've done all your research. It's a bold <laughs> thing to do. We have to be really bold in uh, what is it? Um, the writer who wrote that uh, Americana. I'm gonna like. I can't say her name. Uh, she lives around here. Chimamanda. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's yeah. right around the corner from me. Don't you? She yeah. says. She says that writers have to be. Um, what is it? Radically free, radical mm -hmm. freedom, or something. So anyway, yeah. So good yeah. For you. No, thank, thank you. you. No, thanks. Thanks for the question too. I hope I hope I did his story the respect it deserves. You know? I want to thank again Adrian and Jason for this conversation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to like go out on a limb and say that's the most anyone's talked about boxing in this room <laughs> in at least 50 years. Yeah. I'm just yeah. going to go out on a limb. Yeah, so back when it was really popular, probably. Yeah, right. Horse racing and boxing. Yes. Right. Um, Adrian and Jason are going to sign books out back or out front here. When you buy a book, Urban Reads is selling Jason's book and selling Adrian's book, most importantly, and uh, they'll be out there. Thank you all again for coming. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening.